In a previous video, which is linked in the description below, I showed how easy and common it is to create a statistical illusion showing efficacy for a drug, even if the drug had no effect at all. In this video, I'll show a different statistical illusion, whereby a drug that's definitely not safe for pregnant women may inevitably be shown to be safe because of a simple trick in the way the data is handled. Now this example is inspired by a real recent study, but because of YouTube censorship rules, I can't say what it was about, but people can find out from my Twitter feed and blog. So the study was attempted to determine if there was an increased risk of stillbirth for pregnant women who took the drug. And the results of the study look something like this. It shows very similar stillbirth rates for those who did and didn't take the drug during pregnancy. And the rates are similar for all women. But the drug was also taken shortly before pregnancy by many women in the study. And women who took the drug prior to pregnancy, but not during it, are included in the no drug during pregnancy category. So what we have are the following four categories of women in the study. Category one, those who never took the drug. Category two, those who took the drug before pregnancy only. Category three, those who took the drug during pregnancy only. And category four, those who took the drug before and during pregnancy. So that's all women in the study. But the study method compared those who took the drug during pregnancy, that's category three and category four, against those who didn't take the drug during pregnancy, that's category one and category two. But what we're really interested to know is the comparison between those who took the drug and those who didn't take the drug. Now what the study didn't provide was any raw data of stillbirth numbers for each category. So what I'm going to do now is show how easy it is to arrive at results like those of method X while hiding the fact that the drug significantly increased risk of stillbirth. So here's a hypothetical example of the raw data we need but which was not provided to the public in the study. So suppose in category one, there was 2,000 women and 20 stillbirths. Category two, 8,000 women, 104 stillbirths. Category three, 8,000 women, 96 stillbirths. And category four, 2,000 women, 28 stillbirths. Then we can look at the stillbirth rate there by just dividing this number by this number. That's 1%, 1.3% here, 1.2% there. 1.4% there. So you can see that there are differences and we can see that overall there were 20,000 women and we add them all together, 248 stillbirths, which gives an overall stillbirth rate for all women of 1.24%. In the study, the method of comparison, as we've said, was to look at those who took the drug during pregnancy against those who didn't. And so what we're doing here is we're going to add these together. We get 10,000 women 124 stillbirths. So for those who took the drug during pregnancy, the stillbirth rate was 1.24%. And over here, those who didn't take the drug during pregnancy, we add this to this, that's 10,000 women. Add this to this, that's 124 stillbirths. And therefore, the same stillbirth rate for those who didn't take the drug during pregnancy. And of course, there we've simulated the same results we saw in the study where these are all equal. But of course, the proper method of comparison is to compare those who took the drug with those who didn't take the drug. And when we add these together, we've got 18,000 women, add these, we've got 228 stillbirths, which gives a stillbirth rate of 1.27%. Whereas for those who never took the drug, we've got that stillbirth rate of 1%. So clearly, the stillbirth rate for those who took the drug is significantly higher than the stillbirth rate for those who didn't take the drug. Or put another way, that equates to 27 more stillbirths per 10,000 pregnancies. And that gives a 27% relative risk increase or a 0.27% absolute risk increase.